Let's do it. Let's do it. Seven o'clock. You'll do your thing. Toss it to me. I'll do my thing. And we're gonna we're gonna we'll start out with uh, we're we're live. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Power Podcast All Star Live Stream Series. We want to thank you for taking time out of your life to spend some time with us on these Tuesday evenings, these Thursday evenings, these Saturday evenings. Uh, hopefully you have been edified. Hopefully you've been enjoying the content. We've had the best of Black America coming to you, giving you all types of insight, encouragement, inspiration, even little nuggets to do some things in the stock market. We just had J.R. Fenwick on this past oh. Saturday. So again, we thank you all for being with us. For those of you who don't know, my name is Brother Bedford, and I am your co-host slash moderator for tonight's festivities. And I'm, I'm extremely excited. So I want to do a couple things, just some housekeeping real quick before I turn you over into the hands of our, our host, Dr. George C. Frazier. So the first thing I need you to do is just go ahead and type in where you're from. Tell us your name and where you're from. The second thing I need you to do is like this page. I need you to follow George Frazier's fan page. Therefore, you'll get all of the notifications of all of the past podcasts, as well as all of the future podcasts that we have coming up. Another way for you to get those notifications is go to www.newblackpower.com. Therefore, you won't miss anything. We don't want you to miss anything that we have to share with you while we're all on this quarantine or this isolation or this incubation period that we're going through. We don't want you to miss anything. The last thing I need you to do, and this is critical, I need you to share this. Let everyone know right now that we're live with Dr. George C. Frazier and Dr. Julianne Malvo. You don't want to miss this. So share this with family, friends, in your Facebook groups. Let everyone know that we're live right now. So with that said, without further ado, I want to turn you over into the father of the networking movement in the Black community, the one who's been teaching us how to connect the dots, how to build effective relationships for over 40 years. And he's going to take us further than that tonight. So please, with the Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube hand of applause, welcome Dr. George C. Frazier. Thank you, Brother Bedford. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Uh, you know, I was a little bit late tonight um, getting on because I was looking for my glasses. Uh, Dr. Malvo, I was looking for my glasses. <laughs> I looked for, them for about seven or eight minutes. I swear to God, I got nervous. And you know where they were, right? In your pocket. No. On uh, top of your head? They're, they're on my head. They're on my head. <laughs> <laughs> they're on my head. And so my, my, my apologies for being a little bit late, but. Um, uh, better late than never. Uh, I feel good tonight. I, I really do. I, I, I don't know what, something about today. I feel energized. I, uh, I watched for the second time today um, a, a Marcus Garvey video that I posted up on my Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Fire, baby. Fire. <laughs> Fire. Fire. You, you got to watch it. If you haven't watched it already, a lot of people have already watched it. But you got to hear what this brother was saying in 1915. And then he declared after they put him in prison that he would be back. He would be back even after he's dead. Well, he is back. He's back in me. He's back in Dr. Julian Malvo. Um, we, we may even talk a little bit about that. But uh, I just feel good. I feel inspired today. Um, yeah, I am tired of sitting in my house. I'm not in my house right now. I'm in my office. Um, and you see what's behind me, right? Books. Uh, Julia and Mal's old books are in my library. And this is just my library in my office. Uh, my library at home is about 10 times this size. Uh, my wife is threatening uh, uh, to divorce me after uh, 47 years, saying that there's uh, almost no room for her. Uh, and it <laughs> seems like there's more room <laughs> for my books and the library. But anyway, um, uh, I'm going to start with a, let's call it an intellectual joke. We'll have to understand a little bit uh, to, to, to get this joke. It's a, it is a joke that is circulating all over Europe as it relates to Donald Trump. And the joke is, what borders 
on stupidity? Oh. The answer is Mexico and Canada. Oh, oh my. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, what's, that's what's being circulated in Europe right, right, right about now. Um, but anyway, without further ado, I want to bring uh, to you um, a celebrated uh, sister uh, who has been around a few minutes. Uh, we're not going to reveal her age. <laughs> uh, she is an elder, though. She's a wise lady, as, 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 as I hope to be a wise man as an elder. And uh, we have done many things together. We have been many places together. Uh, we have spoken on many platforms together. I have learned much of what I know, certainly about economics from Dr. Julianne Malvo, as you know, my huge focus right now and in, until I die uh, is economics and financial education in particular and educating our people uh, with a faith-based initiative called WINS, Wealth Building Centers and Curriculum, doing well. Um, but that's a whole nother story at another time. Um, what I want to do is what I've done with all of our illustrious um, power podcasters is I want to give her a formal edu edu uh, introduction. Um, she deserves it. She's worked for it. I have not memorized her uh, bio, which would be multiple pages. Uh, we don't want to spend the hour on just an introduction. We really want to seek her advice and counsel. And so let me just um, so do a, a quick little dramatic read uh, of her bio. This is Dr. Julianne Malvo. Uh, she is an economist, an author, educator, and commentator whose popular writings have appeared in USA Today, Black Issues in Higher Education, Ms. Magazine, Essence Magazine, uh, The Progressive, and many more. Too many to mention. She is a PhD from MIT. Now, we know that there are no affirmative action PhDs from MIT. Now, affirmative action may have gotten her into MIT. Probably not. But if it did, we know that it will not keep you in <laughs> MIT. And you will not get a, ba a PhD based on affirmative action. You will just simply have to do the work. Uh, well known for her appearances on national network programs, including CNN, BET, PBS, NBC, ABC, Fox News, MSNBC, CNBC, C-SPAN, and everything that's out there. All right. Dr. Mm -hmm. Malvo offers commentary on subjects ranging from economics to women's rights and public policy. She has hosted local and national television and radio programs and designed workshops and trainings on public policy, economics, and diversity issues for corporations, civic organizations, colleges, and universities, and others. Dr. Malvo has, uh, was, I should say, the 15th president of Bennett College for Women in Greensboro, North Carolina. And as the leader of the nation's oldest HBCU for women, she was responsible for, among other things, the first capital construction uh, campaign of the campus in more than 25 years. Prior to, uh, to her work at Bennett College, Dr. Malvo held several faculty positions and owned a production company. A committed activist and civic leader, Dr. Malvo has held positions in women's rights organizations, and policy organizations, and currently she is on the board of the Economic Policy Institute. She's also president of Push Excel, uh, the educational branch of the Rainbow Push Coalition. Finally, Dr. Malvo has also lectured at more than 500 colleges and universities and spoken at dozens of corporate events. Um, in 2014, she founded the Economic Education uh, founded of uh, Economic Education, a 501c3 organization focusing on financial and economic literacy. Dr. Malvo's most recent book, Are We Better Off? Race, Obama, and Public Policy, is available from Amazon and or from www.juliannemalvo.com. She is working on a new book. We'll talk about that 
And without further ado, please welcome to the podcast, none other than our queen of economics. I didn't say black economics, I mean economics in general, because she has a holistic view of economics worldwide, Dr. Julianne Malvo. Dr. Malvo. George Franklin, be- thank you. Give you an air hug, an air hug. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing? I'm, I'm doing okay. You know, I'm bored of this, you know, social isolation, but yes. uh, it's it's a nece- it's a necessary, and I'm really not beyond being bored. I'm livid that the the governor of Georgia is telling people to go get manicures and uh, haircuts when they haven't peaked yet. You know, so this, I mean, some people in this country are just not well. That's all I have to say. Or they're, they're under some pressure to, for commercial reasons. But what's more important? This is why predatory capitalism is so corrupt. What's more important, a life or a manicure? I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. You know, that segues uh, into the first uh, main subject I, I wanted to talk about with you is your take on, your spin on, your understanding, your advice and counsel um, around COVID-19. Uh, you have written a lot about it. You think about it. We have talked about it. Uh, you have a lot of insights about it. Um, you may even have some suggestions to Black people on how to make money during a pandemic, right? So I want to, this is about you. It's not about me. My, my job is just to frame up the conversation and to let you say your piece. Okay, well, everything that's wrong with our society is magnified by COVID-19. We see, Mm. you know, five weeks ago, I said, it's going to hit Black people harder. One of my editors said, oh, you're paranoid. I'm not paranoid. It has hit Black people harder. But you know, white America has a cold, Black America has pneumonia. And so, but then when they listed the correlate diseases, the correlate conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, heart trouble, lung trouble, those are all black people diseases. So we knew that it was gonna hit us harder. The biggest challenge, have, having said that and having accepted uh, the very slow um, imposition of the social distancing, because the man uh, in the wire, I, I'm trying not to curse, I'm trying not to disrespect the idiot. Oh, I already did. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the man in the wire, he doesn't get it. He simply doesn't get it. He's looking at profits as opposed to looking at people. So, you know, even as late as uh, yesterday, he was talking about, well, maybe, you know, we should open the country back up after he listed some guidelines that were excellent guidelines about how you really know that he didn't write the guidelines, you know, Dr. Fossey or Dr. Britz did, but they were excellent guidelines. How do you know when you're actually peaking and how do you know when you're going back down? Um, but all this stuff hits us harder for what kind of reasons? Because you and I, George, can isolate in place. We work at home. We don't have, I mean, we, we, we hate that we're missing our speeches and our folks, but we can work at home. Can the sister who is um, a home health worker work at home? Can, she work at somebody else's home, but not hers. The brother who's delivering the mail, can he work at home? And you know, the post office does not even give these folks masks. They have to get their own. And you, and as you know, as everybody knows in, in the country, those things are in short supply. But the, the, differ, the economic differentials between black folks and white folks and the fact that black people are at the margin in our economy means that the COV, uh, this core, I call it the coronavirus, it hits us much, much harder. And we're seeing it. Um, not only in terms of the medical profession, there are, you know, the CNAs, the people who clean hospitals, who clean hospitals, they're vulnerable. Who's driving buses? Brothers. And mm-hmm. you saw the brother in Detroit um, who died after he said, you know, this is some nasty stuff. And I'll tell you, I live in downtown DC. I'm not going to diss my neighbors or anything, but some of these folks do not wear masks. Some of these folks, either they, and they just don't get it. They think their, their privilege extends to an immunity from COVID and it does not. Um, but Andy, back to the other discrimination is a discrimination that occurs when legislation is passed with no sensitivity to who's affected. In other words, um, 
there was a brother, there were t he was talking about, he's a felon, a former felon who has a business. He doesn't, he doesn't qualify for the business relief because he has, because he's felt. Now, why is that? It's because this is in SBA language all the time. So you're a felon, and you're, but you're a taxpayer and you're ge generating income for all of us because you're hiring people. You, you can't get one of these loans. You see who got the money. I mean, what's the, um, Shake Shake got so much they had to pass, take it back. Give it back. Yeah. How did Shake Shake get all that money? You know, but large corporations, people who were um, basically poised to deal with this stuff, they're going to get the money, and the smaller folks are just not going to get it. Um, and then you have, um, as, as many of our friends and colleagues are, people who are independent contractors, freelancers, really. Uh, there's supposed to be a provision in there for them, but I spoke to an accountant who said, yeah, there's a whole lot of paperwork, and you know, by the time you finish the paperwork, the money will be gone. That's right. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. So it's, um, our lives are going to change in so many ways. My heart bleeds for the young people who didn't get their graduation, um, may have their entry to the labor market delayed, um, but it's, it's deeper than that. We're going to see people in our community, especially those who are in the service occupations, either hit health-wise or hit economically. Health-wise, more vulnerable, but economically, I don't know how many waiters and waitresses have been laid off. I don't know how many. And, and so what, what do you do? And that's where we are, is asking, what do we do? And so, George, this is a very good time, really, for people to take stock, to really take stock in what their financial position is, what yeah. their plan B is. You know, what are we going to do? We're, we're not going into a recession. We're in a recession. Uh, the World Bank has said that this recession may last until the end of 2020. Others say longer. Uh, the m amount of money that's been thrown into the economy um, is a good amount, but it wasn't spread out evenly. So if corporate, the airline industry will be bailed out, but what about the people who buy airline tickets? So, you know, they're going to do well, but is everybody going to do well? And that's always what happens in our country because predatory capitalism thrives on inequality. So, you know, so, you know, when I think about this, I think about so, so many ways. I mean, I've diced it and sliced it. Uh, and I think I wrote five columns in a row about this stuff because there's so many ways to dice and slice it. I mean, my, one of my other concerns, I talked about young people. Well, you know, 82% of white people have desktop or laptop computers right. compared to about 65% of black people. Okay, so if you, everybody has, not everybody, 80% of everybody has a, a smartphone. But if you're trying to get a lesson, you don't want to get a lesson on a smartphone. Think of a young person who's supposed to be online learning on a smartphone, really? Um, it just doesn't make any sense. So, how, how, uh, Julian, how will this, in your, your opinion, impact the election? It depends. It depends on what we do. I mean, I think that Bubblehead is trying to, um, you know, he doesn't want mail ballots. And, every, you know, there have been so many studies, people don't cheat on mail ballots, but he doesn't want mail ballots. Some states do their whole election by mail. You never go to a polling place. Right. So if he, if he has his way, as opposed to some of the other people who are pushing for mail ballots, um, I don't know if turnout will be the same. Depending on where we, go, we are with the COVID-19, I don't know if people will, you know, come out. If you, you know, if people in communities are dying or are ill, you want to say, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay home. Um, what we know about election patterns is that old white people are more likely to vote than young black people. Right. And that's shorthand for, you know, what goes on. And so we really have to energize our community. Now, the challenge with that, of course, is I don't know that many younger people who are excited about Joe Biden. I mean. He does not inspire, um, I don't know, elation, you know? He, he does not inspire, I mean, Trump inspires elation among his wacky constituents. They love him. I don't, I've never, I've not never, I've rarely heard people say they loved Joe Biden. People loved Barack Obama or hated him, but basically loved President Obama. They, those who love 45, they love him. 
Have you ever heard anyone say they love Joe Biden? No. You know, so he doesn't inspire, inspire the kind of thing where, you know, I'm going to vote if it's the last thing I do. So we have to, we elders have to talk it up. I don't care if you don't like Joe Biden. We really got to get rid of that fool. Right. I, will, will Kamala Harris, if he selects her as vice president, help him, you think? I don't know. Um, certainly, it would be a, send a strong signal to black women. Um, and she is fantastic. She's a friend and uh, another uh, Bay Area person. You know, I'm from San Francisco, so. Right, right. Uh, but so, I, I, but I don't know. Here's my fear. If you, Biden, a choice, if you had a choice, Doc, between Stacey Abrams and Kamala Harris, who would you pick? Kamala. Okay. No question. She has more uh, governing experience um, at a higher level. Um, Stacey's great. I like her very much. I think I'm, I can't wait to see what she does next. Um, you know, but I, th I don't, I won't say I don't think she's ready. Cause I think, you know, if that that's in there now is ready, uh, you know, Bubba the Fool is ready. I mean, but I, I just, I think Kamala comes at it, comes at it in, a, in a very different way. But I'm also, I, I'm chastising myself because I'm trying to get in people's heads. I'm trying to get in white men's heads. Because my big question is, as old as Joe Biden is, and I'm not dissing him, I'm not an ageist, but we do know that he's, what, 78 or 77? Um, 77. Okay. So the, the, what his main um, selection criteria really ought to be, who can do this if I'm gone? Because, you know, just looking at uh, the dynamics and life ex expectancy and all of that, who can do this if I'm gone? Now, if we're thinking that, you know, a white boy is thinking that, excuse me, white boy, folks were say white boy, but y'all know, I just keep it real. Um, but anyway, they're thinking, and they're thinking, do I really want a black woman to be vice president and she might become president? You know, I'm just thinking, that, I'm thinking that That'll be on people's minds now, you know, especially exactly. with, with his age. And, and yeah. he's, you know, he's not 110%, let's just, but he was way. a lot it's sharper. He, when I look at Joe Biden um, in 2020, and I compare it to Joe Biden in 2008, it's a it's a market difference. Come I on. mean, you know, and of course we'll, we'll all age, and we all won't be who we were when we were 25. But right. um, but you know, for the president of the United States, it's just kind of. It's something that we need to just think about. And so while I would love to see a black woman uh, in that position, I'm not, see, I'm not even sure white men could possibly stand a white woman, you know, in the position. So I'm not sure that, um, but anyway, uh, we've got, we got our work cut out for us. And we've, we've got our work cut out for us. That's all, you know, that's all I can say. So we have to get out the vote. I mean, at, the, at the end of the day, when you look at the numbers from Trump, being elected in 2016, especially in the key states, yeah, um, uh, him winning by such a small margin of votes in each of those states that he ultimately won, and you look at the number of Black people who were eligible to vote in those states but did not vote in those states, that would, and again, I don't blame Black people for this, but, but no, that's certainly... because a lot of people didn't vote either. Not know? that right. That's right. Well, but but there was a lot of chicanery too, George. In, in Michigan, there was chicanery. There were votes that were discarded in Detroit. Um, in Pennsylvania, there was some chicanery. And in Wisconsin as well. Uh, I forgot who I was talking to who was talking about poll, polling place closing early, things like that. So we have to also be vigilant about voter suppression uh, because voter suppression is something that these people like to do. They don't want us voting anyway. And so if you can basically discourage the vote, why not? So we- That's I, a Republican strategy, correct? Voters it's absolutely- there's, We yeah. outnumber them. We outnumber them. Democrats certainly outnumber the Republicans. We, we, we outnumber them, but they discourage us. And a lot of our folks are not, uh, I won't say not sophisticated, but you know, the, the amount of, quote, fake news that's going on um, is absurd. A, a relative of mine told me that they didn't believe that COVID-19 was real because they heard it was co connected to broadband and 5G. Right. And this person is someone I respect, mostly. Um, but, but anyway, I'm like, are you serious? 
they're serious. They will not wear masks because they think it's, it's fake. And, and there's a lot, and, you know, this person isn't the only one, but there are a lot of folks like that. They, they, yes, they don't, and then there, there are some of our people who think we can't get it. See, um, this COVID-19. So we, when, six, in 16, we had all these people, the, you know, the bots, the Russian bots, et cetera, were sending folks, sending emails and stuff out. Some people believe those emails. And uh, you don't have to suppress the whole vote. If you suppress, if you win by uh, 1% and 2% was suppressed, there you have it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm very concerned. Doctor, um, are there any lessons, let's say personal lessons, um, that you have learned or extracted from this extraordinary once in a 100 year uh, event? Is there, in, in terms of just personal introspection, having never gone through this uh, in your life, uh, unless you're 102 and you were around for the Spanish flu, uh, no one, no one has gone through this. No. It's, yeah, if you look- Well, it's, you, caused me to, it's caused me to do a lot of reflecting. Um, I spent a fair amount of time by myself anyway, just because I'm a writer and I'm in the house, but I also spent a lot of time on the road too. So I've not been on anybody's road. I've been basically in my house, in my office, or down here, in my, I'm, in my, I'm in my dining room. My office is upstairs, but it's too uh, messy to let y'all come up there. Um, but anyway, a uh, lot of reflective time about various and sundry things, um, about my life path, about what I want to do next. Um, I mean, I'm, as you say, I, I, I do, I don't get social security, but I could if I wanted to, let's just put it that way. So, you know, it's, this is the, as my golfing brothers call, this is the back, li back nine. I'm not middle-aged yeah. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. Oh, you know, I have a lot of time to think about some things. It's some things I do want to do, and I organize myself in a way to do them um, and to make sure that I have the commitment that I want to have to do them. I think I want to uh, perhaps go back to teaching or at least spend more time with students. Um, that, to, I get a lot of joy from students, and they, they mm -hmm. really keep you on your toes. They really make you think. And I think that young people make old people young. So mm -hmm. I agree. You know, I agree. Well, would, would, you, would you teach at Howard? If I mean, you're right there. You're if the opportunity presented itself. The right opportunity. The right opportunity. Let let me say, tell you something. Many college presidents don't want ex presidents running around their campus. Uh, I didn't think about it that way. Yeah, yeah. But, but for folks who are confident and out of that, no, I would consider Howard. I've always, I almost went to Howard a, a, a lifetime ago when I was uh, graduating from, well, not, well, when I was not graduating from high school. So I got put out of high school, I went to college. Boston College white folks were ha very happy to have me. Howard admitted me and then they said, please send your high school diploma. I wrote them back, don't have one. They wrote me back. Well, you can't come to campus till you have you a said, high school. Wait, 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 hold, hold. You said you were put out of high school? Well, kind of, yeah. I was a horrible child. <laughs> I mean, I really was. I mean, I, it's a wonder I lived to graduate from college because my, I, I don't, I'm surprised that my mother didn't just execute me on the spot. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, once she told me my curfew was midnight, I asked her what she thought the probability, the statistical probability of me getting home at midnight was. Oh. <laughs> she still let me go. Now, if that was my kid, I'd like to go and say, oh, well, if you don't know if you can get home at your curfew, you don't have to go outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But no, I was a horrible child. But you got that. I mean, I've got that rebel in me, and even though you know, I, and I and I have it. People say, "You're have you calmed down yet?" Nope. And listening to uh, Marcus Garvey, we should never calm down. We should never yeah. ever calm down. Yeah. I'm so happy that you turned me on to that. I've read a lot of his stuff, but I've never heard heard him. And um, his phraseology is so rich. Woo. Uh, the, you right. know, the way that and, and some of the things he said. You and I and Susan Taylor and I don't know, all of us have said at one point or another, oh, talking yeah. about, sure. you know, I remember not too long ago, it might have been before the uh, quarantine, I was somewhere and a woman said, oh, your name is so lovely. Are you French? And I looked, I said, you know, the slave master was French. That wasn't me. Um, <laughs> and when you say that to white people, they get, they get annoyed. But that's the truth. I'm not French. I'm black. You know, right, right, now, there right, may right. Be some, there's some stuff rolling around. 
out of there. Have you done, have the, you done the DNA? Have you done uh, uh, mm -hmm. African answer? You haven't done that yet? Mm -mm. I, don't, I don't want to find my white people. I'm still mad. <laughs> yeah. um, stock market, stock market. We had uh, J.R. Finwick, who, a brother who done a marvelous job in, in trying to help black folks understand uh, the, the ins and outs of the stock market. What are, you, what are your thoughts about what's going on, recovery? Is it a good time? Uh, if there, there, there will be a recovery. Uh, the United States, if there's not a recovery, there will be a world depression. The United States is the largest economy. Uh, we, we may be a little, well, we're the largest per capita. Um, I, the China numbers may be the, eh, just about that much higher, but they're, I don't know, a bazillion of them. So um, that was a really good academic word, right? Bazillion. Um, but anyway. Uh, the, uh, just like a college president. A, <laughs> bazillion. But we will, you know, the stock market is low. It's going to be low for a while. My guess is, I don't know late this year, early next year. So if you see some bargains out there, I mean, there's some blue chips that may, you should go for them. The other thing that's interesting, and I still, I would, I would not advise anybody to do this, but I'm thinking about it, is the oil stocks. This stuff is at a minus level. Which I know. Means they pay you to come get their oil. Minus $37 uh, dollars per get barrel. I'll pay you money. I will pay you $37. Minus $37 a barrel. They're, they're, they're not going to be drilling. I mean, they're just... Uh, why would they drill? I mean, they're losing money on every barrel that they, they, they pull up. Well, there you have it. Um, so the question becomes, do you want to look at that industry five years on? Or do you want to do something that may be a bit more uh, adventurous, but we don't know how profitable, by looking at alternative energy sources, looking at solar, looking at wind. I mean, President Obama tried to do some things with those, didn't work out. I think it was, he was ahead of the curve on those things. Uh, one guy got $500 million and blew it. Uh, wasn't mm -hmm. able to produce yeah. what he was supposed to produce. But I think that the technology is advanced now. So I think alternative energy sources, I think are something that people should look at. And what more of us need to do, more black folks need to do, is to read the business pages, read the business news, follow the stock market, even if you don't have any stock, because if you don't have stock directly, you probably have some indirectly. If your company, although fewer companies now, but if your company has a pension fund, you got some money in there. If you, if you have a, a money market fund, you probably have somebody there. Mutual right. fund, something in there. So we just need to be knowledgeable. Uh, right. and does, it doesn't mean you need to have encyclopedic knowledge, but it means that you have, to, you know, one of the things that's, that's interesting, I'm talking to a brother who has a company, he teaches protocol. And so he's, he was talking to me about small talk. He says, you know, some people don't do small talk. Well, small talk for white men is the stock market. You know, so if you're trying to get into a certain industry and, you know, you're having coffee with a potential employer, stock market. What happened to that Apple stock? You know, I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's just a, you know, easy yeah. conversation. Well, Everything doesn't have to be, what, how, do, how do you like those cubs, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, small talk for us is our new car. Small mm -hmm. talk for them is the stock market, right? That that has to shift. We'll know we'll, we'll know that, that we have arrived when the when the kitchen table conversation turns into the stock market. Um, let me just uh, just out of curiosity, of one's uh, portfolio assets, what would be a conservative number in your portfolio represented by stocks? It depends on how old you are. It really depends on how old you are. Uh, if you are in your 20s, even your 30s, um, you can carry a lot of stock and you can uh, tweak your portfolio as, it, um, as things change. If you are over 60, you have to be much more careful. When yeah. are you going to retire? I mean, that becomes a looming question. When are you going to retire? The, child, the problem with, remember when George Bush wanted to take our Social Security and put it in the stock market? Yeah, I remember that. That was some crazy stuff. But the problem with that is, so you get fluctuations in the stock market. So if I choose to retire in a slump, that's gonna be my retirement. If right. I choose to retire in an expansion, that's gonna be my retirement. Mm -hmm. So basically you have to deal with your age in terms of what your portfolio ought to look like. Now, 
I advise people, first of all, do a heck of reading. You can do your own thing investment wise. You can go on Motley Fool or something and learn, but you can also work with a broker and there's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure that you're paying a reasonable um, fee and it should be under 2%. Um, just make sure you're paying a reasonable fee. But basically uh, everything, the other thing of course would be your marital status, how many kids you have. So your personal situation determines how much stock you want to carry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're, um, you're writing a book. Yes. How, how deep are you into it? Are you halfway there? Are you almost finished? You're going to self-publish? What are you going to do? Oh, no, no, no. I have a contract with, uh, I have a contract for the book. Uh, it's, I'm going to be a bit late on my deadline just because, um, but I am probably a third of the way in. Okay. I'm excited about it. I'm extremely excited about it. Um, What's the working title? Black Money, Then, Now, and in the Future. We're going to change it, but that's the work. That's the working yeah, title. Yeah, no, okay, okay. The, and and so, so to sort of give us a, a, a synopsis of it, prepare it. And by the way, when it's ready, absolutely, I want to help people promote it. Oh, thank you. Well, then, what did we have? It's what we had, what we have now, and what we could have. So then is what we used to have. And we used to have a lot. Um, now is, I call it the data rob, what we have now. And the future is just purely what I call Afrofuturism. What could we have? Mm. What could we have if we could take over an industry? What could we have if we got reparations? Uh, so that, that's just sort of blue sky thinking. So I, have, I haven't even, that part of the book, I'm gonna end up going someplace um, where they have nice water um, and chill and write. Because I, I have to be basically free for that part. But the other parts, of the, I mean, the data romp is going to be a lot of work, but I know that, and I've gotten, got requests in to get the data. One of the things that's holding me up these days, it makes me cry, is that the Library of Congress is closed. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've been getting a lot of stuff from the Library of Congress, and being there is just, it's, it's just a, such a blessing to see all that's there. One of the things I'll make you laugh, so... Um, I got, the thing about research is you go into a rabbit hole. So you say you're going to write about X, and then you end up writing about something else. So I got into this lynching rabbit hole, um, writing about, because, well, because I believe that lynching was economic. But then I started, because when black people got too much, they started lynching us. I mean, literally, I mean, if you look at Black Wall Street, there was an article in a newspaper where the, the man said that he was asked, why do you think this happened? He said, too many ends have too much money. Because you know, with Black Wall Street, you could hear the money fall, you know, just turn over. We had oil. Um, we, white folks would let us go to their library, so we built our own. Excuse me. So we built our own. We had physicians. We had a department store. Thanks. Banks. Thanks. The what the, the, to make you? I, I know people remember, or hope I hope you do. Dr. Olivia Hooker, who was the last living survivor of Tulsa, and she was my buddy. Um, and that's a long story that I won't tell you. It's kind of funny, but um, I, I love Dr. Hooker, and she said we didn't have to go downtown for anything but the bank. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. her father owned the department store, and the only way that some people were able play to recover was because, hmm? play pardon? I want you to play futurist for a moment. Okay, it kind of, it's, you know, go ahead, I'm sorry. And, and um, there's a delay in here, so it, oh, that was, okay. it, I'm interrupting you, but it's a delay. Um, if you could play futurist for a moment and say, uh, let's say you could wave a magic wand, where do you think because that's a real interesting premise, and I'm, I'm looking forward to you writing about it. What industries or market segments do you think we could ultimately, if we play our cards right, dominate? Gee, that's what I'm thinking about these days, is where could we, it has to be, it has, what well, would have to be is something on the ground floor that also had something unique, some unique production input that we could get ultimate control of. So if you think about the minerals on the African continent, is there a possibility that we might get control of one of those mineral sources 
that is in use because you know those minerals are used for things like cell phones mm -hmm. you know so we could, we're able to get one of those mineral sources and then you know blow it blow it up that's a possibility um yeah okay um talk to us about black banks i know you're going to cover this in your yeah, I've book. got a chapter by, by one of the chapters in my book that I love is, is about black banking. But I start out by talking about Maggie Lena Walker. Maggie Lena Walker was the first black woman to charter a bank. She chartered one in 1903 in Richmond, Virginia. And that bank stayed around for one, more than 100 years until 2005 when it went out of business. But that's the longest tenured black owned bank. A lot of people think of the Freedmen's Bank that, of course, Frederick Douglass was the president of. And a lot of people don't, a lot of black people historically did not trust banking because Freedmen's Bank went out of business. People got pennies on the dollar. But what is not often told is that the reason that Freedmen's Bank went out of business was not because of Frederick Douglass. It wasn't because of black people. It's because they accepted crooked white investors. Yes. And, and, and that's what ended up happening, crooked. So, but anyway, Maggie Lena, back to Maggie Lena. So this sister was so bad. I, I, I would, when you were, uh, we were talking about Marcus Garvey, I was like, I wish I had some Maggie Lena because she, she just was a pistol. She um, founded this bank, but then George, she founded a department store because she did not, she, she, her base was a, a fraternal organization called the International, you know, the Independent Order of St. Luke's. So, she had St. Luke's Penny Savings Bank, which became Consolidated Bank, but she also had St. Luke's Department Store. So the reason she founded the department store, black women couldn't go into the store and put a hat on their head. You know, black women couldn't try something on. So she wanted to create that environment. And most of the work that black women did was menial. You go, you, if you weren't a school teacher, you know, basically you were a maid. And so she wanted to create some good jobs for black women. Uh, when she opened the store, they had, it was very exciting. Then white folks got crazy. They said, how dare this black woman open a store? So they, the white merchants in Richmond formed a white retailers association. A white retailers association. Then they went to suppliers in New York and other places. If you sell to her, we won't buy from you. And that effectively put them out of business within seven years. But the bank, meanwhile, thrived, and she had something of a, you know, very interesting, because she, she was a bougie sister, and, uh, but she was also a hardworking economic visionary. And so the visionary part that's interesting, George, is that as people were talking about the Great Depression, leading into it, Maggie Lena, I call her Maggie Lena like she was one of my girls, but um, Maggie Lena said, look at all these small black banks we have. We need to, we need to put together because otherwise we're going to go out of business. So she got three of the other banks, two of the other banks, and that's how they formed Consolidated. So right before the Depression, you got this Black-owned bank that was strong and so strong that it lasted after the Depression another 70 years. So now, meanwhile, we've had more than 123 Black-owned banks in the history of Black people. Uh, we only have 23 now. Um, maybe 15 years ago, we had 45. And now we're down to 23. Uh, and there are all kinds of reasons. Uh, chicanery, uh, changing banking regulations. Um, we lost a couple of our banks. Um, remember this SNL crisis um, because they changed their reser reserve requirements. And the reserves are how much money you have to have. You know, if your bank is, you, everybody, every dollar that's deposited in the bank does not stay in the bank. But right. the reserve requirement says you have to have so much in the bank. So in any case, um, we, we have, we've had over 123 Black-owned banks in our history. And I said, now we have 23. And in my book, I talk about two others. I talk a lot about Maggie Lena and um, Consolidated. But I also talk about Industrial Bank in Washington. And Industrial Bank was the only Black bank founded during the Depression. Uh, it was founded by a man named Jesse Mitchell. Uh, his grandson, Doyle Mitchell, is the president of the bank now. And, um, and he's They're in the D.C. area, right? They're in the D.C. Yeah. area. In the D.C. area, but they just bought a couple banks in New Jersey. So um, a bank that was on the brink of uh, basically closing, they, they purchased that bank. 
and it had two branches. But in any case, industri the industrial story is a great story. And then, of course, uh, One United Bank um, blew up, got into prominence with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, because, because uh, what's a kill? I don't even know who Killer Mike is. That shows you my ignorance. Uh, but anyway, Killer Mike went somewhere and said, "Put your money, take your money out of um, white folks' banks and put it in black-owned banks." And so One United kind of jumped on that, and mar they market very heavily to our community. And um, you know, they they've got a lot of visibility. They had the the One United. It started out make, really making that you talk about my history. Uh, Unity Bank and Trust opened in Boston in the wake of Dr. King's uh, assassination. About six banks opened in the wake of Dr. King's assassination. The Unity Bank and Trust, the, the, the black station, radio station in Boston was WILD. Uh, wild. And um, they had a commercial uh, that said, uh, Community Bank and Unity, Unity Bank and Trust. And, when I started doing this research on banging, the jingle came back in my head. It's like, and it wouldn't go away. But, um, but Unity went out of business after about, or closed, they went defaulted after about four years. Then they became Boston Bank of Commerce, still black owned, but with a much more neutral name. Uh, and then uh, in and out, in and out. And then it, they became One United. They bought several smaller banks maybe three actually, not several, maybe three smaller banks and became one united. Their main headquarters are in LA and Boston. Um, Doc, um, I saw the Kill Mike campaign where he was encouraging black people to take their money out of white banks and put it in black banks. I live in Cleveland, there is no black bank here. So what's a good strategy? What's a good way for black folk who are not privileged to have one of the 23 black owned banks uh, that still exist. What is a good way for them to do that? Is it, do these blank banks have apps, so to speak? Oh yeah, no, all of them. Uh, well, I know that industrial and one United both, uh, one United markets itself as a national bank. They probably have about 30,000 um, ATMs that you can use with no fee all over the country. And they, and they, at a point in time, were encouraging people to deposit with them, um, even if they, no matter where they lived. Uh, Industrial has not had such an aggressive marketing campaign, but they are a national bank as well. They'll take your money okay. wherever. The challenge, George, is that while Black-owned banks want our deposits, the difference between their success and their failure is actually investors. The people who are willing to invest $10,000 in the bank and, you know, as with any other investment, watch it grow. And at a point in time when you need your money, take it out. But yeah, so, no, unpack, unpack investment, uh, Doc. Um, when you say you buy stock in the bank, is that what you're saying? Uh, buy stock in the bank, yeah. It's, it's not just a deposit. It's, it's, by, it's purchasing stock. It's, you know, yeah. So the problem with investing, it's not a problem. Every, most investors want to maximize their rate of return. If I tell you that interest rate for this is 15% and this one is five, you're going with the 15. Sure. Well, banks can't make 15%. They can maybe make seven. So if you choose to invest in a black owned bank, it's, because, it's basically because of loyalty, because you believe in the mission and you believe in the cause. And increasingly generationally, there's some people who don't believe in the mission and cause. You know, I mean, I, you know, so it's, 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 it's a question. And then when I was doing the research on One United, I came upon a um, very critical article about them from a brother who felt that they should be more aggressive in the community, that they didn't lend enough in the community. Doyle Mitchell told me that his bank lives 90% of what they lend is in the community. But nice. you know, with One United, there was some criticism. I don't want to go too far into this because we don't have a lot of time left, but you know, we got about, we got about 10 minutes and, and brother Bedford, hold on a sec, brother Bedford, see if, um, if there are any questions oh, yeah. uh, for Dr. Malvo, uh, tee that up. Um, and while you're teeing that up, looking, looking and seeing if there's uh, uh, questions that people want to personally ask her, uh, you know, brothers and sisters do it. You're not going to get this kind of general interaction uh, with this economic uh, star that we have here, so uh, write your questions. And uh, Brother Bedford, you has a you you have a bead on it, right? You, uh, 
I do. Yes, I do, George. I have some. Okay. okay. While we're waiting for that, I'm, um, I generally uh, close these interviews um, uh, with some questions. These are these yeah. are um, fast questions. They don't they don't deserve uh, long answers. <laughs> Um, you know, wh wh whatever is uh, uh, on the top of your head. So here's the first one. Um, if you were to die and to come back as a person or a thing, what do you think it would be? Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, what is your most treasured possession? Mm. I couldn't answer that because I have too much stuff. Um, really, uh, but I, I'm very blessed to have lots of lovely things and, uh, I just leave it at that. Okay. Um, if you could wave a magic wand other than Washington DC, where would you love to live? Accra, Ghana. Where? Accra, Ghana. Accra? Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I love it there. Or San Francisco, uh, where my mom is, but... Let's mix it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is the quality that you like most in a man, woman, or, or, or friends? The quality you like most in a man, woman, or friends? Kindness. Kindness. Okay. Um, what do you value most in your friends? Loyalty. Loyalty. Who are your favorite writers? Zora Neale Hurston, Holly uh, Marshall, she, Nikki Giovanni. Um, I thought I was going to be a poet at one point in my life. Um, but that, I, won, I won Essence Magazine's first college essay contest with a poem that was called Black Love is a Bittersweetness. Um, and it was an essay poem. But um, anyway, other favorite writers. Um, hmm. See, I read it. Well, I love the Boyce's uh, writing. The Souls of Black Folks is, you know, every, every time I read it, I just, I, it, it's just so, 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 you know, yeah. amazing. And of course, Toni Morrison, uh, I that could, couldn't write like her, but I sure love reading her. Even the stuff that's turgid. I mean, some of her stuff is very turgid. You've got to be very patient, but, you know, sentence can last a page, <laughs> but I still love her work. And one of my favorite books, coming of age books, is The Bluest Eye. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorites is James Baldwin. I grew up with James Baldwin. I read everything he wrote. He had a very his stuff too. Well, I'll tell you another funny story about me. You have so many funny stories. I met James Baldwin in a bar um, in New York. I forgot the name of that place. There were two bars. One was called Under the Stairs. And the, I think it was Under the Stairs. There were two bars. Anyway. I was just coming in from somewhere and I said, I think I'll just sit here and have me a drink. Um, and I was sitting next to James Baldwin. Get out of here. <laughs> and we ended up talking. I mean, they put us out the bar. We ended up talking all night. What was he like personally? Really very thoughtful. Um, a little essential, a little uh, querulous. Um, I said something and he said, well, no, that's not gonna happen. Um, uh, I think it was about that movie, If Bill Street Could Talk. And I was saying, you know, I would love to see that as a movie, which it had, did, since then, did become. Yeah, it's a and great I, movie, too. It, it really is. But he said, oh, that's not going to happen. I was like, hmm, okay. Um, well, I mean, we just, we talked about politics. We talked about um, New York City. Uh, you know, we talked yeah. a little, you know, we talked a little economics. It was just one of those free-flowing conversations. And I was so honored. I mean, I just was so honored yeah. that the actor, James Baldwin, I mean, I was in my 20s then. Um, and I'm like, James Baldwin was sitting here talking to me, you know? <laughs> all this stuff was running through my head about, you know, go tell it on the mountain, Giovanni's room, you know, all of his stuff, you know? And I'm like, right. but it was, right. it, was, it, was a cool, it was a cool experience. Yeah. Um, who is your, uh, who are your heroes? in fiction and in life? Well, in life, my mom is my biggest hero. She was uh, raised to be one of those bougie bougies. Uh, she married someone she couldn't get along with, so she divorced. 
after six years and raised five children by herself. A PhD, two wow. MBAs, a law degree, you know. So she, and she, she loves education. Her, she probably has four shelves, looking like that shelf you have there in the back um, with all those books on it. Mm -hmm. She loves books and she gave us all a sense of adventure, you know. So and she really is, I mean, when I think about her life, I think about what could have been had she been in a different space. But she told me that when I, when she, <laughs> she used to talk about my father bad, um, they had an interesting relationship. But I said, well, you hated him that much. Why did she you marry she, 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 she didn't turn you against your dad, did, did, did she? That's a long story that we will we'll okay. keep another okay. time. All right. But um, let's see. Uh, when I asked her, I said, well, mommy, if you didn't like him, why'd you marry him? She said, well, I was 26 and my mother said I had to. Can you imagine? Um, Wow. That, if you were 26, you were like an old babe. Right, 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 right. Um, the final short question is, what's your, fav what's your favorite curse word? <laughs> I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm not saying. Well, You've heard, well, you heard me talk before. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Just give us the first letter. You don't have to say it. Yeah. Marilyn Farmer. Okay. <laughs> and I really shouldn't use it because the root of it is anti-feminist, but in any case. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Brother, Brother Benford, do we have any questions for Dr. Monroe? Malvo? I should say Monroe, Malvo. <laughs> yes, sir. We do have around five or six questions. We'll try to get through as many of them as we possibly yeah. can. Uh, before we get into the question, just quickly do want to remind everyone to make sure that you put on your calendar that this Thursday, we have Pastor Freddie Haynes coming up. So we wanted to make sure we, yeah, so we wanted to make sure we let everyone know to put that on your calendar. That's for this Thursday before we get into this question says, we have six questions. I don't know if we're gonna be able to get to all of them, but uh, pardon me for looking down, but I'm gonna try to get through them quickly. The first one uh, comes from Yvette. What is your opinion about the electoral vote versus the popular vote? There are historic reasons for the Electoral College, but I think it's time to move to the popular vote. The historic reasons have to do with the different size of states and wanting to make sure that people had equal say, that like itty bitty state like Vermont didn't get overrun by a big old state like California. But I think this has to be, it has to be reimagined because what happened in the last election and in the election where uh, Al Gore lost uh, is criminal. Okay. Okay. The next question comes from Adam. Adam wants to know, um, are there particular psychological biases that African-Americans are subject to that you think will put us at a greater economical disadvantage due to this corona recession than our cultural counterparts? Are there, hmm. particular, are there particular psychological biases that African-Americans are subject to that you think will put us at a greater economical disadvantage due to the coronavirus than our counterparts? Well, because there's economic discrimination, there are going to be some people who are going to make money off this coronavirus. They're not going to be Black people, or they're not likely to be. Banks are not likely to lend to us. We're seeing some of that right now. Um, and when there are innovation opportunities, uh, we're not likely to share in those. So the biases that other people hold toward us probably are barriers to wealth. But I want to say that we also have bi bi barriers and biases towards ourselves. There are too many Black folks who believe I can't do it when you possibly can. There are too many, I, I'm not going to try this. I'm not going to take a risk. And um, a lot of Black people are risk averse. But we shouldn't necessarily be risk averse. Risk is a part of life. So we all, even as we look at racism in our society, we also have to check ourselves. Mm -hmm. Great. This comes from Rebecca, and I think you kind of touched on this earlier, but she wants to know, how do I open up an account with a black bank? If you don't live in an area that has one, go online to either Industrial or One United, and you can basically develop an online relationship with the black bank. Vince wants to know, what are your thoughts about cryptocurrency? Is it a worthwhile investment? Also, what are your suggestions about trading options through a broker? Regarding cryptocurrency, I, I just don't deal with it. I mean, I, some people have made money. Some people have lost a lot of money. Um, it's something that I, you know, I would have to say I'm undereducated because the concept of it um, 
is, is inimical to me or it's now, eight o'clock now what you, the question was how options are a great idea if you are really smart if you really really understand the options game a lot of people lose money with options so you have to be willing to follow those stocks i mean you really have to be willing you have to be on that stuff you know every day right. but the, the, you can't make money with options the last question is from jennifer she wants to know what three things must black women do right now a have a plan a b and c <laughs> about your personal life about your professional life you know about your children and just have keep open keep your options open number two don't believe the hype there are a lot of people who benefit from tension between black men and black women so don't believe the hype there may be a, a you know a lousy brother in your past that does not mean that black men allows it means that one brother was because i, I the White folks benefit when black folks are at odds with each other. Right. So just, I would say, don't believe the hype. And the third thing I would say that black women must do is save your money, sister. Awesome, awesome. Back Amen. to you, George. Amen and hallelujah, no question about it. And I think mama told most of our sisters to, do, you know, to, 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 to be able to stand on your own, save your money, and uh, you'll have a lot more options. Um, Dr. Malvo, as usual awesome thank you thank you thank you that's just a beautiful picture of you the way that is framed you got a beautiful piece of art behind you two very very interesting sculptures one on the left one on the right uh you of course always dressed impeccably uh beautiful glasses i mean you're just a a, a picture of class uh and brilliance and uh, it, it was an honor to have you on tonight uh, thank you for all that you've given us um, over your career, really. Uh, certainly to me, at the, in the, your contributions to the Power Networking Conference have always been spectacular. And uh, you've been with us on many occasions. We love you for that. I will probably see you also at the Institute for the Black World <clears throat> Conference. I believe that is in October. It's October. No, I think, I think we've pushed it off. No, it's the, yes. Oh, yes, he did. That's right. He moved. There may be something he's else going on. Some, he's going to have some peace. Dr. Daniels is going to have some peace. Um, for those of you um, who would like to attend the Power Networking Conference, I'm going to make our standard offer uh, for our podcast. As you know, I have limited it significantly. Uh, we have been oversubscribed because, you know, I limited to five, only five people because it's just a crazy ass deal. Okay. So I got to limit it to five people. Um, and, 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 and so uh, I apologize uh, to the 12 people over the five uh, <laughs> last week that uh, asked for the deal. Um, and as I told you, if I don't get in touch with you, you didn't make the cut. Now, as you know, to get this deal, it's, it's a very simple but powerful deal. Uh, a full registration for an adult at the conference is, is $1,500. If you met one person that could help change the trajectory of your life, would that be worth $1,500? Yes, hell to the yes, it would be worth it. You'll meet more than one. All right. Number two, we encourage you to bring a young person so they can sit at the feet of masters like Dr. Julianne Malvo. All right. So our student registration is uh, $800. All right. So you add $800, $1,500, that's $2,300 for you to attend. Uh, it will be a life changing experience. I promise you that. Now, what we're gonna do for five people tonight, the first five people, is to reduce that by $1,900 and give it to you for $399, All right? So it's a $1,900 discount for being smart enough to, wa uh, to watch us tonight uh, with uh, Dr. Julia Malvo. <clears throat> now, in order to get it, you have to email me. And that's G Fraser, F R A S as in Sam E R at FraserNet.com.com. G Fraser at FraserNet.com. G Fraser at FraserNet.com. You simply say in the subject line, I'm in. And then you put your name and your cell number. If your cell number isn't in there and I can't call you, I will just ignore it and move to the next person. Okay? So put your cell number. It says to me, you can't follow instructions. All right? So, 
the first five, and we know that all emails are timestamped. That's how we know who the first five are. So that's the offer, limited to five. Um, and uh, the conference, by the way, oop, oop, I'm, glad, I'm glad I thought, I thought of it. I was, I was just getting ready to remind you, George. <laughs> moved it to a new date because Black people are disproportionately impacted by this thing called COVID-19 more so than white people, right? So we want to be absolutely safe. We hope that all of this will be flatlined, let's say by June. Our original date was July 8th through the 11th. So we're moving it to October the 14th through the 17th. So if it's flatlined by June-ish during the beginning of the summer, that will give you four to five months to recover economically and psychologically. Because the minute they open the gates, however that may be, there's still going to be a very high percentage of the people who are going to be reluctant and, and will still want to do social distancing, want to do masking. They will still be suspicious. They may need some time to recover financially as well. So we want to give you at least four to five months for recovery period. So that's what we're doing. And by the way, we're going to pray that it doesn't reappear uh, as we go into the, the uh, chillier months, although that's just right around the beginning of the fall. So that's the offer. G Fraser at FraserNet.com. I'm in your name and your cell number, first five people, $1,900 discount, and that is $399. So, Dr. Malvo, any final words? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity and for the um role modeling you do for all of us around connecting. I mean, you are the master connector and it's something that we can all learn from you in terms of how we work together as opposed to apart. And we, we didn't get to talk about Brother Garvey's, um, his speech, but that was one of the points he made uh, about people working together. It was, it was a brilliant speech. So I, I would simply say, folks, know, know your history. Know your history. Our history is so important. It's an empowering history if you know it. If you didn't know about Maggie Lena Walker, you can wait for my book to come out, or you can also Google her and learn more about uh, the bank and about her. If you live in Richmond or around Richmond, there's a statue. She's, there are less than 10 black women statues in the United States of America. Wow. There's one to her. So anyway, I could keep on, you, as you know, I could get wound up. I'm not gonna get wound up, George. It was a great opportunity. Thank you for your leadership, and I appreciate you. And Brother Beckford, good to meet you. Good to see you again, too, Dr. John. Malvo, real quick, before we sign off, your website, any way that you want people to get in contact with you, how do they stay updated about the book and, and be able to connect with you? How do they do that? My website is just, my name is www.julianmalvo.com. And my columns that I write weekly are always on the website and, and you know, other stuff. My Facebook page is julianmalvo.com. No, it's just Julian Malvo on Facebook. My uh, Twitter is Dr. J Last Word, because I like to get the last word. And my Instagram is Dr. J Last Word. Great, great. Awesome. Let, me, let, me, let, yeah, let me just close with one little, as you know, I like to close with a quote. Um, it's one that you'll find in um, Success Runs in Our Race, I wrote 26 years ago, and it's about relationships. Relationships never die a natural death. They are always murdered by attitude, behavior, ego, or ignorance. Ooh. Protect the relationships. Love you. That's a powerful quote. Love you too, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Love you, babe. Thank, thank you. Take care, everyone. All right. Yeah.